All right, so just to give you an introduction, we're uh, this is a Twinil AI meetup, and we're going over the FASA course. So last week we had met and discussed the lesson one. I'll briefly give a recap of the previous meetup, and uh, today we hope to discuss lesson two along with three mini presentations. Uh, I'll be talking about FASA camera framework, which is something um, that we from a virtual study group. Uh, Asia virtual study group had built, and Vijay will be talking about the Con Learner uh, API, so to speak, which is inside Fastly. So he's actually dug into the API, and he'll be talking about all of the things that go on inside there. And Christian had shared his uh, image downloader script uh, during the last meetup, and he'll, he'll be giving a mini presentation on it today. So today is our second meetup, and if you aren't a member of the Twimil AI Slack, please do join using the link. It's it's there in the slides. I'll just share the link to the slides after the meetup. And uh, the study groups happens 9 a.m. PST every Saturday. So you're welcome to join. Anyone is welcome to join. And we'll be rotating hosts. So today I, Chaim Bhutani, will be presenting. And if you feel there any uh, mistakes in the presentation, so I'm the person to be blamed today. And uh, we're trying this approach that we're preferring to talk about some applications over the theory, because that's what we observed during our last meetup that uh, talking about some mini projects or mini presentation would be a better idea. So if you want to present any idea or any project, please reach out to Kai. And it could be a, any any simple project. Uh, Five minute presentation would even be good. So you're very welcome to present. And this is the rough agenda for the meetup. Uh, we, we, we meet every Saturday. Uh, even the Saturday, even one Saturday when we don't have the first day, .ai lecture, we'll, we'll be doing a meetup, uh, which is the 8th of December. So just to give you a recap, uh, we had a dis discussion of the lesson one during our previous meetup. Sebastian had presented uh, presented PyTorch and Parsot AI APIs overview. And if you remember, Kai had done a wrench versus hammer real time image classification, which is uh, pretty cool. Christian had shared his tool to scrape images from multiple sources uh, Google, Bing, uh, and I'm not sure I'm going to I'm sorry. And I had briefly spoken about the not hot dog app that I'm trying to build along with a few members from the Asia virtual study group. So this is the overview that Sebastian had presented. And uh, today's agenda is I'll, I'll try to cover the second lecture first. Uh, so that uh, we could go over it, and after that, I'll uh, I'll we'll move to the further discussions and the many presentations because last time we had we were slightly short on time. So any any questions so far? Any questions from the previous meetup or anything you want to discuss? Yes, I, I yes I do. Um, on the uh, Slack. Uh, someone asked for the link to watch uh, the uh, the uh, presentations, and uh, we were asked not to give that link out. But my confusion, just based on what you said, is that <clears throat> if someone belongs to the Slack group, then I should be able to do that, or or no? Share the link to watch the classes. That's what the guy was asking for. But he was, he did it on Slack, so he was already part of the group. Yeah, like um, we wouldn't want to violate the code of conduct, which is that we're not allowed to share YouTube link outside of fast.av3. So uh, that's why we don't suggest sharing the link outside. But uh, I understand no, that. I mean, sharing uh, outside means, I, don't, I think Slack also is the Slack group, you anybody can join the Slack group, I okay. think it 
doesn't mean that you are so, registered so just because court. you're in slack does it mean you have permission okay that's what i needed to know thank you uh, i have yeah, so a, just just another quick question um I, so i can see that this is being recorded um is is this recording made available afterwards so for example i, I missed the first one yes uh, is, yes it's oh, going to great. be on this on the twimo youtube channel great thank you I'd like to moving ahead. Uh, I'll, I'll just give a brief overview of the lesson too because uh, most of it was pretty easy paced this time, uh, I feel. And you're welcome to ask any questions if you want. So Jeremy had uh, talked about downloading images from Google. He had said this um, two lines of code that you could uh, dump inside your um, browser inspector and you could download images from Google. He had shown the teddy bear versus grizzly bear versus black bear classifier. And then he had shown a demo, which was a widget developed by the San Francisco uh, group, which was how do you delete the noisy data? And it's, it's a pretty cool tool. If you, if you watch the lecture, you just get the misclassified, uh, the misclassified labels and you could delete the images if you feel that it's actually a mistake. So th that's definitely something worth checking out. And there was a mention of, well, there is in fact an example of combining the human expert with the model to accuracy. So the human expert here being asked in the equation that probably right now we're better classifier, uh, better at classifying teddy bears versus grizzly bears than the model. So even in real life, uh, for example, there was a mention of if I remember correctly, uh, cancer prediction uh, using image images in the in the lecture, and uh, some field expert had converted uh, the data to images and then built a classifier on top. So that's another way we could improve the model's accuracy. Uh, after that, it was uh, how do we pick the learning rate effectively? If it's a slow learning rate, your model will converts very slowly that is your error rate will go down but it will go down very slowly if it's a bigger learning rate your validation loss will probably shoot to much higher values and in that case you'll want to reduce it uh, the correct learning rate in my experience can be found through experimentation or by using the learner plot function inside fast.ai so that's something I, I think that it, it comes better with experimentation and eventually you, you get to pick the learning correctly. And I would suggest actually trying some building some basic uh, toy models and figuring out how do you how do you tune the learning rate, so to speak. So, so this time around, Jeremy recommends actually 0 0.03 as a, as a good starting point, I guess. Um, yes. Uh, even without, even without thinking, so the, the first the first kind of couple of epochs, he just said 0 0.03, which is a little bit different to what he was teaching last time. But uh, yeah, so I find it interesting. Yeah, he had mentioned that um, during their experimentation, the password AI uh, researchers experimentation, they found that 0 0.03 is a good starting value. So uh, that out probably when you try more. I guess I guess this is for pre-trained models, the 0 0.03. But I did I did training from scratch. Uh, uh, I did ResNet create CNN with a, with pre-trained false, and I've used um, the 0 0.02 for some reason, and it worked well as well. So okay. I guess this kind this kind of French wor works well. Seems to be. I think you also said that it's uh, for a lot of cases not that important. So. If the range is somewhere around this uh, uh, 0 0.003, then it's going to work for most of the cases. Yeah, yeah. In the one in egg three and one in egg two range, I suppose. Yeah. As far as downloading the images from Google, I was I I did what Jeremy suggested in lesson two. Um, and, and that worked for me. But I was wondering if anyone compared that to uh, what we talked about last week uh, in this study group. Is Jeremy's method better or worse? 
than uh, some things other people have done to download images? For people who weren't here for the last one, would you be able to just quickly tell us what you talked about last week? Yeah, so in, in terms of uh, um, scraping images, um, I showed this uh, Python package. Uh, I think it's called Google Google Images Download or something. You will find that when you Google that. And it basically, um, uh, for downloading um, images from the Google search without uh, without having to open a browser, so you can run it on a on a remote machine. And um, Jeremy showed a more uh, I think a more manual way where you kind of scrape the uh, uh, links from from the browser with uh, a little uh, JavaScript snippet, and then um, you just uh, load the the links uh, inside the Python script and download the images. So it's a little bit more manual, but you um, the advantage is that you kind of you open the the the, uh, the browser, you see the images scroll down a little bit, and then for example, in in his uh, teddy bear example, you can see a lot of teddy bears, and you know okay, there, uh, the, this image uh, set is valid. So uh, when you do that completely remote, you either have to look into the pictures, uh, so scroll through the pictures, or uh, you don't know what's in the data set. So when you search some very specific thing that Google maybe does not cover that good, it's going to probably going to give you uh, uh, bad images, I think. Mm -hmm. I think the... Which recommended is uh, that when you're building a model, you should experiment more, and that's why the non stop production ready approach is Jeremy, which allows you to experiment. Uh, it actually downloads the image in a single folder, which is also something you wouldn't want because you would want them in separate folders. But there are ways to uh, allow splitting the data set by simply passing arguments to the function and they pass it. Sanya, your, your voice is scrambled a little bit, or is that only for me or, or also for the others? It's for everyone, it seems. Okay. Can you maybe, like last time, uh, switch off your video so that you have some, some, more, some more bandwidth for your, for your voice? So it's scrambled a little bit. So I think your video is frozen too. Uh, is, it, is it better now? Yes, I can hear now. I can't seem to load the presentation. Um, I can share it, maybe. Well, can you see? Is it... Yeah, we can see it now. We can see it now, yeah. Okay. So yeah, uh, moving ahead, uh, there was mention of Starlet and Flask APIs to put models into production uh, when deploying on a web uh, web framework. And uh, there was a demo by, if I remember correctly, Simon, who had put an app into production using Starlet and won, an, uh, won a hackathon. So I actually checked out the API and it's pretty cool. I would highly recommend checking it out. Um, was that it, it was pretty uh, slow paced, up, which was basically matrix multiplication refresher. And um, we built a stochastic gra uh, gradient descent classifier from scratch. So I think that's uh, that's my summary for lesson two. Do you, do you want to discuss anything else? It, did anyone use this uh, Starlet framework? So I, I know Flask and uh... My colleagues are using that for building web APIs, but did anyone use this Starlet? No, not until now. I found it very interesting for, especially for data. Yep, I tried, yep, I tried to use this Starlet and I created this very little app called Alligator versus Crocodile. And I, I guess I shared the link yesterday. So it is very similar to Flask. You, you just want to check the documentation and it won't take more than 20 minutes to understand the framework. It is very easy and very similar to Flask. Okay. Interesting. 
if you're already familiar with Flask, is there some uh, advantage to Starlet from what you've seen? I think it's uh, you can do asynchronous uh, stuff, so you don't have to stop your program when you are waiting for a request to come back. Yes, yes. Does like... anyone, anyone know Firefly? The package Firefly? Um, because that basically wraps an, uh, a RESTful uh, return function over, over any Python function. I just came across that at PyData Germany. I was wondering if anyone is using that. Firefly? Firefly Python is, is the package name. And basically what it gives you, it gives you a, an endpoint to any function. So if you have a predict function, you just put a decorator on top and it should give you like the predict endpoint. Huh? But yeah, I was just wondering. It seems to be pretty new. Uh, so should I move ahead with the mini presentations? Sorry, just I've I've got a question. Uh, so, I'm relatively new to um, deep learning, and uh, there was some confusion about um, you know the error rates for validation sets and training sets, and then finally someone said, "Oh," and and then Jeremy said that he had he had got them wrong. Can can someone in like uh, in two minutes kind of explain what what the learning where, where the error rate needs to be lower and why? Um, because I'm sorry, I just haven't had the the time to experiment to understand or to to understand which one should be which way around. The way I understood, uh, you know, when Jeremy was saying is the 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 error rate in the training set needs to be lesser than what it is in the validation set, and that's perfectly acceptable. That's what I think. I got out of that particular discussion. Great, and and why is that the case? Because he says a well, uh, uh, you know, well done model would be able to do a better uh, error rate on the training set than the validation set. The common misconception yeah. uh, that exists is that uh, lesser train uh, error rate on the training data and uh, compared to the validation is overfitting, which Jeremy said is in the case. And the reason uh, that is because your model is more accustomed to the training data, so that's perfectly normal, I suppose. Uh, can I can I say my two cents? Maybe I'm right or wrong, but I got this idea from Andrew Eng in three 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 years ago. Uh, the idea is 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 that uh, the training set and the, the validation set both should be around the same uh, behavior. I mean, if you have uh, decreasing in the accuracy of uh, of of uh, 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 increasing in the accuracy, decreasing in the error of the training set then you should always have uh, the validation set is improving also. Uh, the idea is that uh, when you have a training set and your model uh, learned on those training set, then, then uh, how well did it learn on that set in comparison to the validation set? So it should be, ideally it should be the same both. If yeah. in case the training set has more errors than the validation set, then that means that you are underfitting. Underfitting does mean that you, your, your model did not fit well with the training. It did not train well on the set. Although it, it could uh, do better with the validation set. How could be that possible? Maybe sometimes you are using some dropouts, for example, some regularization. This will, will come, I think, in lesson four or five later on. Uh, uh, you will you will uh, intentionally introduce some noise in the learning in order to to, to generalize better on the training because you don't you don't want to overfit over those images only so you introduce a, a random noise in the learning process this is a dropout so sometimes you have an underfit where the training error is larger than the validation error the other case when you have much better uh, training than validation. The training error is much less than the validation. In this case, you have an overfitting. Why it is overfitting? This because you have fit more than what is required on the training. 
maybe you think that this is good, but but uh, actually uh, uh, overtraining or, or only the training set is is is. Uh, I mean, I mean, uh, later on when you are uh, deploying the, the system, then you will see uh, new images. So you cannot uh, recognize those images as well as the training. So ideally so, it should be uh, both the CM going down the, the CM. When the, uh, when, when the training set is getting better, so the training uh, um, error is getting better and the validation set not, that basically means that the uh, the network is memorizing the training set, and that's it's not generalizing to to uh, yeah. set. Yeah. Exactly. But uh, Jeremy also said that uh, um, he tried it, and it's pretty hard to to get this uh, ResNet net to overfitting. So um, it's not that prone to overfitting. So uh, yeah, Jeremy specifically mentioned that if you want to detect overfitting, then your error rate, which is always on the validation set. It uh, gets uh, keeps getting worse uh, after each epoch. It uh, doesn't necessarily mean uh, if your training loss is yeah. lesser than validation loss, it uh, doesn't necessarily mean that you're overfitting. But if your error rate is getting worse, that means you're overfitting. Yeah. And it's pretty hard to do that on this net. Correct. Yeah, also on this net. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, so I was, I was just going to say, I was going to make a quick distinction. So you can have cases where you're training error is going down and your validation error isn't going down as fast but it's still going down and i mean in in that scenario you're still at least partially generalizing and so your error is improving and i think the point that jeremy tried to make at some point or maybe i heard this somewhere else and i'm misrepresenting what he said i'm not sure but the idea is it's when the two start to diverge and move in different directions, that's when you're overfitting and that's when your error rate's gonna start going up. It's not necessarily every time that the training error is lower than the validation error that you've got an overfit model and it's bad. Yeah, I think I, I, uh, I have this is the same opinion. Jeremy seems to think that uh, well, he's kind of loose. Training, you can compare training and validation loss as you're moving along and worry if one is larger or, or one is smaller than the other. But if the error that you're getting is tending to decrease as you go along, maybe you don't need to worry too much about which uh, uh, is larger, you know, for training or validation set. It's when your error find ultimately starts increasing you know, then uh, if you reach that point, then uh, there's a problem that you're no longer generalizing. Yeah, that, that was my understanding as well. So yeah, like but, th uh, this time, like he only says the error rate is your kind of key measure that, that yeah, I agree. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Basically, the error goes down, starts increasing again after point. So yeah, um, moving ahead, I'll I'll just quickly talk about a framework, and then we'll move on to the other mini presentation. So I had mentioned this Nord hot dog app during our previous meetup, and uh, the fast load A camera is a framework developed by Cedric. This is in my work, uh, and I just wanted to highlight it that now we have PyTorch working on an Android device. So just to give a brief. So you the GitHub repo link is there in the slides. Uh, to give a brief overview, we basically exported Pytorch model to Onyx, and uh, we're running it on the mobile phone, which is an Android phone with the Cafe 2 backend. And Facebook actually provides boilerplate, uh, I suppose, Android app to run this. And using that, Cedric was able to run the pre-trained uh, SqueezeNet model on his Android phone. So uh, if, if this this is interesting to you, I'd suggest checking it out. There's a video demo as well. And uh, just, just, just to give you an idea why we're doing this is, instead of deploying on the cloud, why not build an app idea, maybe try something on your mobile phone? Because I suppose some mobile phones are powerful enough to run basic models. So the not hot dog app is a proxy to check or benchmark how good is the mobile phone.
Um, I was wondering, is like, like what are your experiences with the Onyx stuff? Because I was interested in, in using that as well and never really used it. Is, is that like straightforward or do you have to be careful? Oh, I'm sorry, this is in my work. This, this has been developed by Cedric. I just wanted ah, to... Okay. okay, sorry. But he did mention it was pretty straightforward like, because Facebook provides the, uh, I suppose, app boilerplate code to just import the model. Uh, the cafe two part is pretty dicey from what I could make out because uh, mm -hmm. cafe two binaries are, are the problem. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen and I suppose Vijay uh, has the con learner, is, is he present with the con learner? Yeah. So as we switch in, there are a couple of questions on the chat. Maybe we could answer, answer those. Uh, there's a question on how to join the Asia study group. I guess Sanyan can help with that. I'll, I'll provide the link in the Slack channel. Thank after. you. Yeah. So are you guys able to see my desktop? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Let me try again. Are you able to see now? Yes. 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 Yep. Okay, great. So, uh, so basically, we all did the lesson one, and you know, when we did uh, learn is equal to create CNN, the data and the model, and then we went on to fit. We realized that we could create world class models, right? So I just wanted to understand what goes on behind those three lines of code that we do, and uh, makes it accessible for us to do. Uh, what we can do, right? So in that endeavor, I went ahead and, and kind of uh, tried to do a double click on the fast AI library. So basically what we see is this, the learn is equal to the create CNN and that has the parameters of data, the architecture, which in this case is the ResNet 34 and then uh, error rate metric, right? And then what it basically does is it creates a classification learner, which in itself is an instance of a learner class, right? And the inputs, we only use three here, but it can be uh, all of this, the, the data, the architecture, the cut, uh, and we'll see why this is there. Then whether the model is pre-trained or not. And then we have a parameter called linear filters. This again is for us to uh, dis define the inputs and the outputs for the additional layers that we will be adding. And we will see what are the other layers that we are adding. Then we have a parameter for uh, dropout, which is kind of fixed right now at 0.5. We can change that if we want. And then we go on to create a custom head and then a, a split on basically to split the, the model that we create and initialize the weights on the, the split that we do. So I have a question, I have a question. Can, I, can I have a question? Sure, go ahead. To the previous slide. So so the documentation on the fast AI is, is great. It's much better than it was. But like the, um, it lists all the arguments for a certain function, but I could not find like the, the explanation of what each argument means. Like you have PS, it's dropout, but is that is that available somewhere? I'm just missing that or is it still something I guess uh, that needs to be improved? So, Michael, I had to really deep dive to find out some of these things. So it was not that straightforward. But right, yes, that, that, yeah. when you make those connections, you start getting a hang of what they are. Right. But they are not described well yet, right? No, in, in they're a, not. In, that's right. That's what I thought as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. So Just uh, one question I have, um, uh, if you go back, and this is with regard to the video where Jeremy talk about the this architecture ResNet 34. Yes. Uh, basically, he was saying like this is just an art uh, the architecture, not the weights we are downloading. I kind of like a flaky on it. What does it actually means? Like what we are saying here, um, we we don't have anything like downloaded uh, weights or anything. Just use. ResNet 34, but if we say use this ResNet 34 architecture, 
is it a um, different way of predicting or th that's where I kind of like a lo got lost. Any idea? Sure. So I'm, I'm not too sure on that either, but I'll tell you what I do understand. So PyTorch supports uh, the transfer learning uh, part of the model, right? And it has uh, support for about 10, 12 different state-of-the-art architectures, including ResNet, Inception, DarkNet, SqueezeNet, and so forth. Unit. And uh, they are downloaded with their layers and with their weights. So when we, uh, you know, if you, if you run the, uh, you know, the code the first time around, uh, and if you don't have the ResNet 34 weights downloaded, my understanding is they get downloaded into your uh, folder at, at, at a certain folder. Post, which is what you're using, saying pre-trained is true. That's correct. Yeah, so the, the, by default, the pre-trained is set to true. So if you don't set it to false, it will get the weights once it gets the model. If you don't want the weights, you set it to false, and then you can train it from scratch. Yeah. So yeah, I think it, basically he was going after that the argument just specifies the architecture, but not always implies that you actually use the weights, I guess. And but like the, that you can override the weights or retrain from scratch, but just apply this kind of an architecture. I think that was a bit of a complicated saying. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, here you you want to have a ResNet thirty four layer composition, and you can use the pre weights or you can't. It's up to you. So Correct. this is okay. transfer learning then, right? Absolutely. Yeah, if, if you use the weights, it's transfer learning because you, you, you build up on, on the pre-trained model. Yeah, that was an interesting question whether you, whether, whether you, could, you could use those weights for commercial like product. And I think whether it was in lecture one or second one and Jeremy, I think, answered, or maybe that was on forums, that wasn't tested that much yet because basically you are, you're using a weights, which is some sort of pro intellectual property or some sort of, you know, and whether the question is whether you can use that in a commercial product with a closed code or stuff like that. I'm not sure how that works. I just right. side question. <laughs> so the, um, without the weights, you just have a skeleton of an architecture and it took some intelligence to think of that and create that and maybe it was even done partially automatically but really you maybe just have random weights and I wouldn't expect that to do very well if you take the weights as well the fully trained uh, model then you're taking advantage of the week or two or months of training and the millions of images that uh, are in the training set that the people who created the weights uh, worked on and you can use all of that and maybe tweak tweak the last few layer weights to do transfer learning. But if you want to ignore all of the work that the people did to create those weights because you have a very customized data set, uh, then just don't just get the architecture and that may be a good architecture for you. Sam, yeah, I would, yeah, I, I, has anyone done just to add to that. Copyright? Is there some source that, that we can go to that will um, give us an understanding of of who owns the data or who owns the model and can we use it for commercial? Has anyone? I think, ResNet, I think ResNet 34 is on GitHub, so it will have the license there. Let me check. Yeah. It's an interesting question because uh, even when you have a custom data set, it's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not enough because you have to have a custom data set that has uh, a lot of data. And sometimes it's uh, transfer learning, uh, or in, in a lot of cases, transfer learning is the only way to, to get a model. Uh, I mean, look at ImageNet, there are like 40 million pictures. Who has a data set like this? Wasn't that in, in one of your interviews, Sam, that, that some companies are reluctant to actually share their, their data or have it embedded in, 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 in trained models because then comp competition will get their kind of custom data and therefore an advantage? Yeah, that's come up from a, a number of different perspectives, both the competitive aspect and I think also in some of these conversations around differential privacy, folks were talking about the ability to like extract out images from a, a model um, uh, via a set of attacks. So there are definitely, definitely issues there. 
the licensing issue has come up, but I haven't, uh, I don't think I've talked to anyone who's had a definitive perspective on that. I think it's like Jeremy said, it's, okay, it's untested at this point. Right, but well, uh, you know, when we refer to the, the when we refer mm. to the weights and so on, what we actually what we do mean though, isn't it that these weights are all that's I mean, this is all based on models that have been trained on ImageNet, and we're using those weights, right? I I don't think it's I think that's what it's referring to, and so so because it's such a wide uh, has such a wide scope in terms of the images there, that's why it's it's pretty good for you know, any new image thing for, for transfer learning. I think that, that, that was my understanding. Yeah, no, I, I think that's why he said is... satellite images, oh. for example, you might want to do some transfer learning because those aren't quite the same as maybe ImageNet. It depends on how closely your data set uh, images co would correspond to ImageNet. But if someone nowadays trains a ResNet 34 on ImageNet, that's <clears> the only thing is basically spending some money on energy cost. There is no intellectual property involved anymore. So anyone can do that. Um, anyone that using the SI library have to, 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 I mean, three lines of code and then you can train it from scratch. So I don't know if this is uh, an IP and uh, topic anymore at the moment. Absolutely, well, I agree with that. You struck on was the point. A big one that, before, but not one. Is that from a legal standpoint in the United States? Well, I don't know. You have to protect, <laughs> you have to protect your IP. So if you allow someone to use it, then it becomes public and, and you lose ownership. So you have to protect it. So that's why some people who have um, the data don't want to share it because if they do, they, they lose other ownership. You know, it, it's like the recipe for Coca-Cola. As long as they keep it within a small group of people and the only people who know it have signed a I'm in agreement not to disclose it, then they own it. But if that is broken, then they lose it. Yeah, I agree. But uh, it's not uh, this, uh, uh, for ImageNet. I mean, ImageNet is, is publicly available. So anyone who's training ResNet on ImageNet is really just spending some uh, some money on, on the energy that, that you have to use for it. So from from the licensing perspective i don't know what 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 sort of license those images are uh, are but so like if it's if it's uh, if it's certain license you can use stuff but you have to keep the same license license so you kind of make it like closed source and stuff like that so i think it's a it's a bigger question i, I agree sure so just going forward yeah let's move on <laughs> <laughs> okay so <laughs> This one is basically, you know, what a learner class is, right? So as we saw the, the, the line of code saying learn is going to create CNN, creates the classification learner, which in itself is a, a instance of the learner class. So if you see the learner class, it has all of these inputs that I have detailed on this side and the methods on the other side um, of which the one circled in green is what we have used in the lesson one, right? We have used LR underscore range for giving the slice. We use the fit method. Uh, we used the unfreeze method, the save method, and the load method, but there are other ones um, that are there as well. And I just want you to have your attention on uh, the one circled in blue, which is the input. Basically, it's a callable that we define, saying the optimizer function that is by default there for the learner class is added, right? Uh, if, because if we see in the code, we are not defining a loss function or an optimizer function. So it is in the code already there that if nothing is defined, then it takes uh, the optimizer function as Adam. So um, moving forward, there are additional functions that I've called um, as we go ahead uh, in the in the way. So one is creation of a body. Basically, this is uh, where we retain the architecture, which is in this case ResNet 34, without some layers, right? And then the head is where we create a custom layer that we stick on top of this body where we have removed the layers. And this new layers basically are able to then uh, kind of fit the number of classes that we want to predict based on the data set that we have. And in the case of lesson one, that is the, 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 the pets or the various breeds of the dogs and cats. Then there are other functions to determine the uh, number of features, the highest number of features that are there in the ResNet 34 architecture. 
and then uh, some other functions to understand where do we split depending upon which model it is. In this case, it is ResNet, so there is a function for ResNet split and uh, metadata to determine what are the layers to be cut depending upon which architecture it is. So again, we use here what is called as a ResNet uh, meta, and we can see what they all mean as we kind of go through the, uh, the, the functions. Right, so I just want you to have uh, a look at this particular core piece of code um, on the learner class. This is a method called post init. So basically here, if you see, I just want you to have your attention on the, uh, the one that I've circled below saying self lot loss function, which is the last function of the learner is basically if there is a loss function defined, it will take that or it will take the loss function of the data, right? So that's what it means. So just look, let's go and see now in the, in the, in the workbook, uh, how the, this kind of uh, manifests. I hope you're able to see my notebook here. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I'm just going to run the code uh, here, which is the creation of a image data bunch. Right. And then it runs show batch. And here, if you come down, uh, this is where, if you see, there is a loss function defined for the data already called cross entropy, or in other words, the negative log likelihood NLL underscore loss, right? Now, I had a hard time figuring out where this is uh, kind of done for the data uh, when it is created because I could not find it in any of the uh, documents. But in one of the checkpoints of the documents, I found that there is a default loss function called cross entropy. Right, but it is in the checkpoint or not in the in the original documents. I'm I'm kind of still to figure out where the loss function is is kind of set. Uh, that's I think that's in PyTorch, right? So that's PyTorch function. Yep, it is. Yeah. So the, the next set of things are basically again PyTorch. So you have a data which is a data set and that has a train data set and a validation data set. So you can call the the X of it, the Y of it, you can see the uh, the kind of uh, you know, the number of images in the train data set, number of images in the validation data set. Then you can see the, you know, the number of images you use in each iteration of the train data loader and the validation data loader as every batch, uh, batch patches through. So even though we say batch size is 64, it's not exactly 64, right? So it's kind of, uh, it, the data loader does some optimization, I believe, to kind of match it to that particular thing. So even though we say BS is 64, it's not exactly 64 here. So then uh, this is the same thing that we do. So <clears throat> next is to run the learn and uh, I will not do the fit one cycle because that'll take time. So let us now go into the code, right? So here is the code for Sorry, the just, just quick, yeah. quick one. Could you just go back to the, that, that point you were making about the batch size? Um, because I, I was a little bit confused by those, those numbers that you said. So there was the, the, the 64 and then I saw 92 and 12. C could you just, um, yeah. Uh, explain that bit again, please. Thank you. Sure. So basically, if you see the way PyTorch works, it has a data set and it has a data loader, right? Data set is basically your X and Y's, your dependent on your targets that you have. And then you, you, you know, kind of send these data via batches, right? So that is what a data loader does. And that is PyTorch's inbuilt uh, kind of uh, functions. So there is a data loader for the train and there is a data loader for the validation set. And you can find for each uh, kind of batch, what is the number of images that goes for training and the number of images that goes for validation, right? And uh, here, if you see it is uh, 92 for the training set. Whereas if you see the batch size that we said, it is 64. So basically, uh, sorry to interrupt you, the 92 here defines the length of the number of batches, not the length of the, not the length of a particular batch. It is the length of a particular batch. So 92 images per batch is, is going in is what I understand. No, uh, what I understand and according to the PyTorch docs, the data dot train length or and length. So when you apply the length function and you write data dot train D underscore DL, it will give you the number of batches in the entire data loader, not the length of the data, not the length of a batch. Okay. What, is the, what is the batch size in this case? We can calculate that. Yeah. yeah. Was that, it 64? The 64? It is, Five seven three divided by sixty four. Let me do that. It's five thousand eight eight eight. Yeah, yeah. 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 So so the number so of batch so sizes. Yeah, that's correct. Yep. So basically, you will have sixty three full batches, and the last batch would have less number of 
images because yeah. it is not the exact divisible of the keyboard. Yeah, okay. that makes sense. That's yeah. good. That, yeah. So length train dot uh, de, length data dot train and with code DL will give you the length of the entire batch number of batches, not yeah. the length of the particular batch. Yeah. That so the, that would mean then the bat the, the batch size of the validation is twice that because if I defined one five one seven, which is the length of the validation data set by twelve, it gives me one hundred twenty six per batch. So it's it's twice of sixty four. Thanks for that. Okay, so just going ahead. No problem. Okay, so let us go into the code itself. Uh, if so, if you see here, this is what the the code behind creation of uh, the classification learner. So the first part is here. So basically, we are going to the, get the metadata of the architecture. That's what a CNN config arc does, right? So the code for that is here. Basically, what it does is it says, given the metadata of a model, get me what is there given for that particular model, which is in this case ResNet 34. And if that is not available, pick up from something called default meta, right? Since you see here, there are dictionaries and in dictionaries, you have a method in Python saying that if there is a value available for a key, give me that value. If it is not available, give me a default value, right? So that, that's what it means. So if we run this code again here. So you'll find that you're getting uh, the, you know, the details perspective, you know, respective to this ResNet 34, which is basically a cut of minus two, meaning the last two layers of the body is to be cut. And if you need to split it, we need to get it from the function called ResNet split, right? So again, trying to get uh, the meta cut from that is minus two. And now we define it as our model. And then if I say this model pre is true, I get the complete model you know, built in for me, right? So this is basically the complete structure or the layers of a ResNet 34 model, right? As you can see here, it, it is layer by layer. It is given to me, you know, what is there inside. Moving forward, so um, what we do here is get the layers of that particular model. That's what this particular, uh, you know, code does, gets me the layers of all of that. And it says, give me everything but the last two layers. That's what this means. And give it to me as a list, right? And then what we do here is, you know, take that and make a model out of it. So nn.sequential is a PyTorch uh, code for making uh, the complete model given a set of layers. So we have the layers in the list function and using that we create the complete model all over again without the last two layers. And we kind of give it into uh, a function called body. So you have everything of ResNet 34 minus the last two layers. And then we want to find out from this particular uh, you know, body, what is the maximum number of features? So what we do here is flatten that so the, the basic, basically because the stacked thing is now flattened out into a, into a normal list that you see here. And then what we do is reverse the order. So if you see here, it starts with a 64 or a, yeah, 64 kind three and 64 kind of a feature list to here, which is a 512 kind of a list, right? Sorry, let me go up. So what we do is we reverse that so that this, the final 12 thing comes up first. And then when we ask for the num features, it, it gives me final and 12 because that is the maximum number of features that is there in that particular uh, architecture. What we do is we then multiply it into two. This is something I could not understand. Why do we do that? But we do that into two. So my understanding is the previous layer, you know, just before the, the last two layers must have uh, something to do with 1024, which is why we are doing that. Then what we do here is then create a custom head, basically to create two more layers to accommodate the data set that we have here, right? So we have 37 classes. So we need to move from 1024, which is the number of inputs to the first layer to 512 to the next layer and 37 as the ultimate uh, output that we get. So again, well, I think, yeah. I think doing uh, this uh, multiplication is with really just getting some some more parameters into this uh, fully connected layer to kind of, I don't know, have a better classifier? Um, I really don't know. So 
why this number two is done is, is something I, I really have to figure. Okay, so just to give you uh, the perspective, what we do is the two layers that we add is this, this, the adaptive concat pool 2D layer, and then the flatten layer. And then we're using a parameter here called linear filters, right? And uh, why we do that is this. Basically what we do here is stick up these three things, the number of parameters that we got, we then multiply that by 12, uh, sorry, multiply that by two, then we retain the number of features and then we retain the number of classes that we need to predict for this particular data set. And then we kind of make the dropout into two. So we initially had something which is 0.5, we make it as a list and then we make it as a subscriptable list, which has two values, 0.25 and 0.5. And then we define two activations, the, for the activation for the first layer being ReLU and activation for the next one being none because there we are predicting the classes. So now we take in these layers, which is the adaptive concat pool 2D and the flatten. We take in this uh, linear filters and we separate them into two, which is now 1024 by 512 and the next one being 512 by 37. To the first layer, which is 1024 by 512, we add the dropout of 0.25 and the activation of ReLU. To the next one, which is 512 by 37, we add the dropout of 0.5 and we don't add any activation there. So that's what this particular function that you see here does, right? And then we again make it as, uh, as a layer uh, and we call it now the head. And what we do is then mix up the head and the body together to create what we want as the learner model. We take that and then we make it as a classification learner, right? Because then we derive all the properties of the learner class. And then we split using the property of split from the meta. Basically it says use the ResNet split. And what the ResNet split does is separate, separates this particular model into two. It's called model of one, which is basically the last two layers and the model of zero and six. Now, I do not understand the significance of this model zero and six, but the significance of this last two layers is what it says is take this model and apply the weight initiation called kaiming her initializer for this, right? So you need to initialize the weights for these two layers because remember when we, even if we say pre pain is true, we are removing the last two layers, which means for these two layers, we need to have weights. And if you have seen the version one of part two last year, I think uh, Jeremy spent some time explaining coming her initializer and why it's specifically suited for uh, ReLU activation. Because we use ReLU for this particular layer, if you, if you remember the 1024 by 512 uses a dropout of 0.25 and uh, a ReLU activation. So we then apply this uh, coming her initializers on it to get us going. So that's how we get this particular learner object. And then we start using the fit and the other things to go ahead. So that's what uh, is the whole mini presentation is all about. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Really a lot good. of stuff going on, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Under the hood, yeah, a lot of stuff. Well, I think the shape of this last, uh, of this head uh, network is really just, uh, I can't, ex I don't know if it's explainable from a math, uh, standpoint, but it's kind of a, uh, uh, that's the way how you create a, um, a fully connected neural network for classification. You get out these features from the, from the ResNet part, and then you, the shape is kind of like this in the, in the network. So you get wider in the first layer, and then you narrow it down to your number of classes. <clears throat> I mean, that's, look at uh, VGG type network that were like the first networks, they are also like this. So the, after the, uh, features from the, from the neural net, it's, it's going into this fully connected layer and then it's getting a little wider and then it's narrowing down to the, uh, to the number of classes in the network. I don't, I don't know if there's a, a good explanation from a mathematical standpoint, but I mean, that's what you see everywhere. True, logically, I think it's, it's the best thing to, to understand it about, yeah. No. Uh, by the way, for this, uh type of understanding. Uh, if we dive in uh, inside the, the library, should we uh, learn PyTorch? I think, uh, I think this will, will come later on, right? Uh, on lesson six, seven. So yes. either I my, I jumped into it without knowing too much of PyTorch. So I see. I see. Yeah. 
I think in part part two of the of the whole course. So um, um, deep learning for code is part two. He's going to explain how he built this library. That's what I understood. So that's probably going to dive into PyTorch in that course. Even even in this course, in the last lesson of the previous version, uh, he did train yeah. uh, Cifar on Py PyTorch from the scratch. Yeah, I, I agree. This was a little bit maybe advanced for uh, for the lesson two as we were because lesson two was more like the basic uh, SGD in, in PyTorch and stuff like that. But uh, for sure, it was very interesting. Uh, the guys here in the the chat group uh, they asking whether you can share the slides for for this presentation because this is very interesting. It's, it's worth uh, to to revise it. Absolutely, I can share the slides and the notebook both. Thank you, thank you. Just a question. Uh, so, is there any value in reviewing any of the version two stuff? Um, so, so, the version two of the course. Um, to, to uh, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't look at version two. I wasn't around for version two. Is there any value in reviewing those um, the lessons there to help with version three? I did both the versions last year, so it made it more easier. But uh, specifically, if you ask me, my experience is you don't need version two to do what you're doing now. And the library is uh, very different, I think, from, from last time. So they changed really a lot. It's a complete rebuild of the library. So I don't know if it's going to help you. Yeah, I think on the, the concept it's good, but you can't really draw much from the, from the code because it's very different. Yeah. Also, the concept okay. changed okay. a little bit. I think the concepts also changed a little bit now. The, the focus is on different things now, I think. So, yeah, I think it's good to stick with, uh, with this course. Uh, unless you have a project that you are, uh, just like me, I'm, I'm in the middle of, of uh, finalizing my PhD. So I, I, need, I need those things that is customizing the, the, the CNN. So I cannot wait until March or April then yeah. when I understand version one. So I have to, 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 to go with the customized uh, CNN to do it in the, the old PyTorch, uh, old FastEye. Yeah, what, what, you could, what you could do, you could, uh, because the notebooks, notebooks, how they created the, that library, they, they are available and they, they pretty much explain how they did it and why they did it and what the decisions they've made. So if you go on GitHub, their, their notebooks are there. So maybe that's the kind of like compromise. And there are no you, videos, of course, but you can just go through notebooks. Yeah. And even yeah, yeah. ask questions on the forums uh, if you're stuck, because like, comparing two versions would be confusing. If you want to jump the gun, you can always ask on the advanced sites. I think the dev notebooks are the ones that, that will walk you through how, how the library was built. So they might be worth uh, looking at. And the, those are going to be, I think, the foundation of the next course, of the part two course. I think I'm okay. Okay, so let me stop sharing and yeah. I think Christian's uh, presentation here, but we almost almost at uh, at the end of the meetup should be. I can just quickly mention it. If I mean, I don't really have a full presentation anyway. It's just. Sure. Okay. Should I quickly just try to grab the screen? Yeah, sure. Yeah, please, please do. Okay, I'll try. Oh, where's my window? Right. Okay, can you uh, see that? Yes, yes. Yes. I can see it. Okay. Oh, shit. What's that? What happened? More than me, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> moving on. Thank you for oversharing. It's all life. <laughs> so, I don't know, uh, Michael just uh, uh, said I should just mention the, the uh, fast class library thingy that I built quickly to um, to basically quickly build a data set for, for the course. I mean, it, it's not, not much, but it's maybe helpful to some. And 
basically I wrote a brief blog post about that and what it is, it's like two scripts. The first one is just a bit more uh, involved uh, iCrawler. So iCrawler is a Python package where you, where you can crawl um, Google or Baidu or Bing for, for images or other stuff. Um, so I took that and I just wrapped around basically a file input uh, with, with the search terms. So basically you can install it from the GitHub. I didn't upload it to, to PyPI yet. So I might do that if it's a bit cleaner. Um, so basically you install it and then you get two scripts. The first one is the uh, FCD, so for fast class download. And the other one is FCC for fast class clean. And with the first one, basically you provide it with the CSV file of uh, two columns. The first column is your search term that you would type into Google, for instance, for Google images. And the second one is any, any um, terms that should be excluded when you build the class name. So in this case, so my example was guitar uh, models. So if I wanna search for Gibson Les Paul guitars, I need the guitar um, keyword as well because Les Paul is a person, otherwise I get loads of, of person images as well but I want to exclude Gita from the class name that it generates, okay? So that's the second column. And the second one is Gibson SG, and it'll do that, and it, it'll go off and just pull them into individual folders, and you can specify now also the number of images. So I, by default, it's like a thousand images, but that can take quite some time, but you can make it smaller. And then basically you just issue this command line here, right? So um, you can crawl all or just Google or just Baidu or Bing. Um, and you write it into Gita's folder and you use these search terms and then it goes off and you, you get these images, which can take some time. And you can also specify if it should resize to, to a certain size already. So it took like 299 with another command flag. And once you have them, it's probably a good idea to, to clean them because I, I found especially if you put in like higher numbers, like the, the further you go down, the, the really worse the results get. So have a look at it. And then previously I was just using the finder on Mac OS to, to, to go through, but I wrote a tiny TK inter uh, GUI to do that. That's the FCC script. And that just gives you like here a window and then you can just quickly use uh, keys to either grade them or mark them for deletion. So what I did for instance was I, I uh, for myself, I classified like four grades of quality. So for instance, one was a good uh, full kind of guitar picture that I want to use. Two was just the, the body of the guitar, still enough to distinguish guitars most often. Uh, three and four I used for, I don't know, just a headstock or a guitar from the back or whatever. So I just filled it out later on. It's just to, to get some information on the images. You can do whatever you want. You can leave it out as well. Then you can also mark images for deletion if they are crap. You just press the D key. And when you're done, you just press X and it'll write a report file and also um, uh, copy the files into a new folder structure with the ones marked for deletion already taking out. Okay, so it's, it's, it's not, nothing big, but it's, it's, it's pretty fast because you, like, whenever you press a key, it'll also already show you the next image. So, so it's like the, like the Google image downloader I showed last time on steroids. Um, not, not really sure. I didn't really look at the, uh, but it, it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of similar, but it, it's, it's reasonably quick to go through there. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because you don't have to install all the all the Chrome stuff for. Yeah, that's that's why I what, why I yeah. went for um, to, uh, this this iCrawler thingy because I didn't yeah. want the other one and like the 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 dependencies are really minimal because TK Inter is also included. So, so no, I thought about using Qt or whatever, but TK Inter is, is fine. There's some bugs with the GUI, but it, it kind of works. I know and it's just that's, that's kind of oh, Bing and Baidu as well, right? Come again? Uh, it, it fetches images from Bing and Baidu as well, right? So it's... It, you yes. can specify where, where, it should, where it should pull it. So if, if you specify with uh, minus C uh, all, it'll take all three. Minus C Google, just Google. Minus C Baidu, minus C Google will take... It's Got it. If you, if you type in um, script name minus minus help, it'll show you the options. Okay. And... Um, are, you, are you supporting this tool on Slack? <laughs> 
<laughs> I, I can, yeah. I, I, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it, it's pretty rough, but it kind of got my data set done. So, I mean, now that Jeremy mentioned it, I, I will clean it up a bit more. Um, yeah, I mean, and happy to, to get uh, input, especially with, with the GUI, because uh, that was really a, a kind of a hack, but it kind of works. And I mean, what I, I use these, these classes of one, two, three, four, four was basically I wanted to prepare different data sets, right? So I said, okay, maybe only take the data set with very good pictures and then another one with grade one and two and grade one, two and three and see if that changes the results. And you get a lot of uh, images though. Like I, I don't really know the restrictions, but there's some download restriction. I think it's like a thousand images maximum. Otherwise they, they block your requests or something. But for instance, I mean, I, I, I pulled like 27 classes, I specify, or 26 classes, and each got like 1,200 images for sure or, or more. So it's plenty of stuff you can read through. Too much, so I, for, for, for the first exercise, I had to restrict it to 11 classes because I got tired of pushing the buttons <laughs> and, and checking the stuff. But yeah, uh, let me know if, if, if it's helpful or how, how to improve it and um, when, when, when I write some tests or make it a bit nicer, I will probably put it on PyPI. Chris, I used, I used your tool last week. I, I found it pretty cool. Excellent. So yeah, um, basically just, uh, you can just get it on, on the GitHub and um, for the moment you have to install it with pip install uh, towards the GitHub um, path plus the egg kind of thingy. And there you get the, the commands and stuff. Uh, the flags, I mean, sorry. That's it. Awesome. Very cool. I, I think we should, should we conclude? There's one more presentation, I guess, right? You have, one, you have presentation, right, Sonia? You wanted to present something. Oh, I'll, I'll move it to the next week because we already. Okay, sure. Okay. So yeah, thank and you. Again, if you want to show, time. if you want to show something, any one of you, just reach out to any one of us here from the Twimmel hosters. Then we would really appreciate that. There's a lot of stuff on chat that we didn't have a chance to address, but uh, we'll try to do that maybe afterwards in, in, a, in a Slack. And I'll drop the chat script. Look, I'll drop the chat transcripts into a uh, Slack after we're done. All right, thank you. Good. Thanks. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks. See you next Bye. time. Thank you. Uh, just one question, if you have time for a few minutes, I think this is for something, an interesting uh, thread that I found in, uh, in, the, in the forum. Uh, should I make a sharing for the desktop? Sure. How, sure. Oh, oh, from where? Where, where is the sharing? Oh, in the one. middle. Top. The green bottom. one in the middle yeah. on the bottom. Yeah, I got it. Let's share. So uh, here is the, the, the thread. Uh, it says that uh, if you have a data set that is very different uh, from, from ImageNet. So you have, uh, everybody can see the, the, sh the desktop? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So you have to uh, use for, for, uh, for custom data sets that are different uh, from ImageNet, you have to make a normalization. So the, the people here, they, they are uh, asking how to nor normalize the data. So in case you have satellite images or some other like x-rays, medical imaging, those are something very different. So uh, you have to use uh, the dot normalize without anything inside the brackets. You know, uh, we use image stats, image net stats. You just yeah. leave it without anything. Then uh, an interesting thing, uh, Mark told us that uh, actually this will compute the, 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 the statistics of your data set, but not the whole data set, only for one batch size. So uh, it's, it's, it's because it's not very important to make uh, a very accurate statistic, you know, 
it's, it's enough to take one batch and, and calculate the statistic from that. Here, he, he, he suggested that for only for that thing, uh, for calculating the statistics, you increase the batch size to the maximum that you can. For, for here, uh, you can see uh, batch size is, is 2,000, just to calculate the statistics. And then uh, uh, I asked Jeremy that if you use your own statistics, uh, the, the, the mean and the standard deviation, is it still okay to use pre-trained model uh, transfer learning if the images are very different from the image net? Or you have to train your model from scratch? So here Jeremy said that if you're using a pre-trained model, you need to use the same statistics if it was trained with. So you cannot use your custom data uh, if your statistics is, is, is significantly different from ImageNet with transfer learning. Uh, actually, I don't know why, but it's an interesting thing that to note, uh, maybe uh, in some cases like satellite images, we, we need to, to, to not use uh, transfer learning. But will will that go kind of go away when you unfreeze? I mean, you kind of like once you unfreeze, wouldn't wouldn't that kind of adjust? Well, you can, you can adjust I, the weights, right? Once you unfreeze. I I thought I thought that transfer learning is always better than nothing because uh, starting from scratch uh, with random weights. Uh, it takes literally weeks. Uh, That's what I thought. Even if your satellite data is, is a bit off, I would just use it and, and, and then basically with the unfreeze, you m m might probably uh, adjust any, any difference. Yes, but I don't I, know. That's just some gut feeling. I mean, I haven't really tested it. Yeah, so there is a competition now at Kaggle and, it, and it, in, in the rules, they, they not allow you to use pre-trained weights. And the reason for that is because they, because like, so the the image net can have biases and all that stuff in it. So you don't really know what's in that image net. So if you, if you decide to use it, you use it with all the biases they have with everything that's built in it. So I guess there's, there might be a reason you want to use from scratch. <coughs> and, uh, and there's a Kaggle competition now that it's not allowed, you, you're not allowed to use pre-trained weights. So that's why I was trying to start it from scratch. And I don't know, maybe I did something wrong, but basically trained very good performance in like five epochs and it didn't take long and it was quite a lot of images um, and it took literally maybe an hour or so to train the image net from scratch so what uh, was your yeah. model resonant uh, i use resonant 34 yeah uh, pla planet planet competition no this is now inclusive images competition so the the idea is that they they they're going to give you different uh, pictures from different parts of the world in different stages so you train your model on set A that comes from say, whatever, America, and then they're going to give you another data set that comes from Europe, and they want to see how your model is doing on say the same kind of pictures, but from different part of the world. So of course, ImageNet would kind of blur that a little bit because ImageNet maybe has got already all those parts of the world. So they want to have that restriction there. Yeah. I, I think I think for for that competition that they have the, some reason regarding the bias. Uh, ImageNet has some bias to, for example, for, for white people. You know, I, I think you yeah. heard that most of the people there is white. But this is something reasonable. But what about if I I'm training something? It's, it's very different from ImageNet. There is no bias, like satellite images. Uh, I don't know. I I I, I was. Yeah, I was I was thinking that uh, it's always better to start from something better than just random noise. I I would imagine like like you know the first one or two layers, no matter how how off they are with the with the colors, but if there's the any kind of a gradient or whatever, even if it's just really the very top of your model, that should still be better than than just having some some white noise there. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Even if it, you need to retrain like the entire thing quite a bit to, to match yourself. I was wondering the same stuff, but that's maybe for another day. What happens if you have like totally diff different data? Like say you have satellite images with like four or five layers. Like is there any way you can, you can help these kind of models even though they have totally different, like they have infrared and, and mid-infrared information instead of it's just RGB? 
this is something very interesting. I searched about it in the forum, and uh, there are not a lot of, of discussions about it. But uh, what we can, we can probably, doing... I mean, we can probably do a, do a chat in the Slack about this kind of stuff. We don't have to draw it out here, but yeah, would yeah. be interesting. Maybe one thing we can do is there is something called a principal component analysis, which helps you to, you know, kind of reduce the dimensions. Yeah. So if you have more dimensions than three, maybe that is something you can do to bring the dimensions to, to three so that you can start over here. Yeah. Anyway. But we can discuss it, discuss stuff like that in, in, in Slack. I would be interested. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so <laughs> see you all next time. Okay, yeah. you all. See you. Thanks see you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye bye.